A very good evening to everyone. Welcome to the annual lecture on crime and punishment, which is the culmination of our crime and punishment summit. This, as you can see, is a collective effort that uh, involves a number of civil society organizations and like-minded people who have all come together to discuss how India punishes. And I think this has become particularly relevant in light of the three new criminal laws which have come into force earlier this month. Of course, the more things change, the more they remain the same. And while the new criminal laws have an impulse of wanting to decolonize crime in India, which is a, which is a great impulse to have, we see that in many respects it's, an, it's old wine in a new bottle. If you were to look at, uh, I was just looking at the number of uh, offenses that have the death penalty in the, in the BNS. There are now 15 offenses which have the death penalty in the BNS compared to 11 in the IPC. And if you look at punishments as well, as in there, while there has been a move towards some form of decriminalization, community service has been added as a form of punishment, still the devil really lies in the details. So we don't really need to focus only on the BNS because the BNS is a symptom of a larger issue of how India thinks of criminal law. And a speaker earlier in the day said that whenever any of us, maybe with the exception of Mr. Sibyl, gets a call from a policeman, we usually tend to get afraid. Uh, at least that first, fear, first reaction is one of fear before we have a, a conversation with the person. And I think this is a symptom of a larger issue of how India's criminal justice system operates. And we need to widen our ambit. It's not just the new criminal laws. It's the PMLA. It's the NDPS Act. It's all the other legislations which are all intended to evoke fear. And our criminal justice system operates in order to ensure that people are afraid and not to reform and rehabilitate. And that is why the subject of our annual lecture today is, are our criminal laws consistent with our constitutional values? And it is my immense privilege to welcome Mr. Kapil Sibyl to deliver this annual lecture. Mr. Sibyl, of course, needs no introduction. And he has been, he wears many hats. He's a senior advocate in the Supreme Court. He was a former cabinet minister and most lately a YouTube sensation. And uh, Mr. Sibyl wears all these hats with great aplomb. And uh, more importantly, he has fought critical cases recently, whether it's the case dealing with challenging the constitutionality of the PMLA, uh, challenging several arrests that have been made, including of him and Soren. Uh, also the Hadia case, and during his time as cabinet minister, something that I followed, then as a law student, he was responsible for the passage of the Right to Education Act, which was one of the key legislations that define social rights in India today. Uh, so we couldn't really think of a better person to do this than Mr. Sibyl. So now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Kapil Sibyl to deliver the inaugural lecture on crime and punishment. Mr. Sibyl. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aragya. It's very kind of you to, and I'm, I'm delighted, of course, to be here. Um, um, it's, I hope it's not a punishment for you. Uh, where, as I finish my lecture, my little talk with you. But I'm really, really intrigued as to why we have these new legislations. There's absolutely no need for um, a new set of laws which uh, tend to move away from our constitutional values and move towards a more totalitarian culture. And uh, my first objection, of course, is that how is the penal court code called the Bhartiya Nyay Sanita? I, I don't understand that. But what has Nyay got to do with it? A penal code is meant to punish people who commit offenses against society. That is why it is the state that prosecutes. The individual does not prosecute. So therefore it's a crime against society. So if you 
do not conform to the values that are prescribed by law and you take law and order into your own hands, society will punish you. That's not nyai. That's punishment. So I don't see why we call this the Bhartiya Nyai Sanita because most of the punishments in this country are actually anyai. So I don't see how this can be called Nyai Sanita. But let's move away from that. The Code of Criminal Procedure is called the Bhartiya Nagrik Suraksha Sanita. It's a code of, it's a procedure. How is it suraksha? So there's a complete non-application of mind, even in respect to how the laws are titled. But let's move away from that. See, <clears throat> take Article 21 of the Constitution. That's really the heart and soul that encapsulates our freedoms. No person shall be deprived of his life or liberty, save in accordance with procedure established by law. In other words, if you want to take away my life, you want to take away my liberty, there must be a procedure established by law. Procedure established by law means that the law will be reasonable and the procedure will be reasonable. That's what was decided in Menika Gandhi. Right? So therefore, if you are going to test any law, you must test it on the touchstone of reasonableness in terms of the law and in terms of the procedure. Right? Now, I'll give a small example. An offense is committed in Maharashtra. Now, under the new code, that offense, if the punishment is between seven, three to seven years, an FIR, que that offense, can be registered anywhere in India. Anywhere in India. And the officer of a police station can investigate that offense anywhere in India. Right? So an offense is committed in Maharashtra. Maharashtra, let's assume, as a state which is ruled by the opposition, the government at the center is different. So somebody in Delhi will be entitled to prosecute a person in Maharashtra, call witnesses, take confessions, investigate the matter, and when the charge sheet is to be filed, it will be filed in the court where the magistrate will take cognizance of the matter. So this is a recipe, uh, 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 an ideal recipe for persecution. Because what will happen is, whichever government is in power, when it comes to opposition states, will start investigating matters. As you know, under the law, it is only where the offense is committed that the police station, which has the jurisdiction over the area, will have been entitled to register an FIR and prosecute. And the magistrate in that area will have the right to take cognizance of the offense. In other words, and that's part of our constitutional structure. In fact, if you look at entry 80 of list 1, you will find that it says that if a person, police officer, wants to move, investigate something outside the jurisdiction of, this, of the area, he will have to go to the other police officer, seek his assistance, and then arrest the person concerned. Okay, so they, because it is part of the federal structure that offenses must be investigated where they are committed, not investigated outside the territory where they are committed. So this is in fact 
subversive of our federal structure. And I'm sure that the, the experts in the government of India must have known that there is no way in which a police officer should be entitled to investigate an offense committed far away from the jurisdiction where it is committed. So these are the kind of laws which I think have been incorporated in the statute without any thought at all. Now, fundamentally, if you really go back to um, when the British were here and Macaulay drafted this law, one interesting feature that you might not know about is that Macaulay introduced in the law that a confession to a police officer is not admissible in evidence. And Macaulay introduced it at a time when in England at that time, confessions to police officers were admissible. That's the kind of enlightened legislation that we inherited from the British. Now, of course, that is still prevalent in India, and uh, of course, that's the law in our country, and that's been decided by the Supreme Court as well. But I'm saying is this was an ideal law which has stood the test of time, and uh, we have made amendments to the law from time to time through recommendations of the Law Commission, and all the three laws were not referred to the Law Commission. In other words, the draft legislations were not referred to the Law Commission. The Law Commission could not and did not apply its mind. And they straight away sent it to the committee. The committee did not ask for expert opinion of leading lawyers in this country and took the expert evidence of some key uh, like-minded uh, lawyers and passed the legislation. Uh, despite protests from, from uh, the opposition. Now, the first issue that arises, and this is something because the Home Minister has been saying that this is uh, a departure from uh, the laws of the colonial era, and I want to make the law more liberal. In fact, what, is, what he's done is just the opposite. Now, fundamentally, under the law, a police officer can arrest a person on the basis of reasonable suspicion that an offense has been committed and take him into custody. Now the fundamental question to be asked is, is that procedurally reasonable? In which country in the world does a police officer have the right to arrest a person, take him into custody, keep him for 15 days under the old law, and now keep him for 15 days spread over a period of 90 days or the 60 days, as the case may be. And then, after that period of 15 days is over, collectively now, then, of course, the court will send him to judicial custody. There is no country in the world that allows for this kind of police investigation and custody. No country in the world. Most laws in the liberal world are where you can arrest a person, produce him within a certain 24 hours before the magistrate, and then he's automatically released on bail. Because the presumption is that you are innocent till you're proved guilty. But here, the police officer can arrest you on suspicion. Now, how is that suspicion tested? It can never be tested. Because it's my subjective satisfaction. Right? And the very interesting, the provision here in the Bhartiya Nyay Sanita, it's very interesting, I'll read it to you. Sorry. Arrest of Persons, Section 35, the new, new uh, Bhartiya Nagrik Suraksha Sanita says, any police officer 
may without an order from a magistrate and without a warrant arrest any person, and I'll read only some part of it, against whom a reasonable complaint has been made. Now, what do you mean by a reasonable complaint? If you read a complaint, it will always be reasonable because the person who complains feels it's reasonable. Or credible information has been received. Now, how do you decide? Police officer decide on credibility. He's not conducting an investigation at that point in time. So how will he decide on credibility? Or a reasonable suspicion exists. Now, how is suspicion reasonable unless you have investigated? that he has committed a cognizable offence. So reasonable suspicion that he has committed a cognizable offence, punishment with imprisonment for a term which may less than seven years, or which may extend to seven years, whether with or without fine, if the following conditions are satisfied. That the police officer has reason to believe on the basis of such complaint, information or suspicion that such person has committed the said offence. Now, how will he, the information is in the complaint. So you'll have to naturally believe the complaint. Right? Whether that is credible or not, he will have to accept whatever is stated. And he will have to suspect. So obviously, he is going to arrest the person. And why have three expressions, reasonable complaint, credible information, and reasonable suspicion. How do you have three expressions here? And the police officer is satisfied that such arrest is necessary to prevent such person from recommitting any further offense. I just want to ask if I may, if somebody files a complaint and that's against, if you file a complaint against me, right, to a police officer, how does he know that I will not commit an offense? Police officer has to be, prevent such person from committing a further offence. How, how will he determine on a complaint? For proper investigation of the offence. So for proper investigation he will arrest me. So how does he know that there is going to be no proper investigation? To prevent such person from causing the evidence of the offence to disappear. But he doesn't even know me yet, he has not even started investigating. To prevent such person from making any inducement, threat, or promise to any person acquainted with the facts of the case. As unless such person is arrested, his presence in the court whenever required cannot be ensured. How does he decide all these things upon receipt of a complaint? He can't. Even if he wants to, he can't. Unless he carries out an investigation before arrest. Then only will he come to some conclusion that there is a reasonable suspicion or there is a credible effect. But that's not contemplated. Then he says, provided that a police officer shall in all cases where the arrest of a person is not required under the provisions of this subsection, record the reasons in writing for not making the arrest. So if it's not required, he'll have to give reasons. If it is required, he doesn't have to give reasons. So, this is the kind of application of mind. So, if you wanted to get rid of the colonial legacy, you should have first scrapped this provision. You can arrest a person, produce him within 24 hours, because that's the constitutional requirement under the constitution, before a magistrate, and you, can, you should give the magistrate reasons why you are arresting him, those reasons can be given to the accused. The lawyer of the accused can address the magistrate and say, on this evidence, I should not be arrested. If the magistrate then considers the prima facie evidence to be sufficient to arrest him, will say, yes, you can arrest him and he will not be released on bail. Right? But this should only, only be done through a procedure that is reasonable, consistent with Article 21 of the Constitution. But that's what it says, procedure established by law. This is no procedure. What you have here in Section 35 is no procedure at all. It is the subjective satisfaction of the police officer 
when he receives a complaint which he believes to be credible on which basis he comes to the conclusion that there is reasonable suspicion and the complaint itself is reasonable right so the first thing that this government should have done was to scrap this procedure because there is no such procedure in the eye of law which is reasonable that's the first issue the second issue is that previously under 167 of the code of criminal procedure you could take a person into custody for a period of 15 days but the 15 days started from the date of arrest now under the new code now the cumulative uh, number of days that is 15 days can be spread over instead of the first 15 days can be spread over to 40 days in the case the charge sheet is to be filed within 60 days and 60 days in case the charge sheet is to be filed within 90 days so what will happen Though, the, though the, the law also says that the, this doesn't prevent the magistrate to grant bail, but the bail will never be granted for the simple reason that the investigating authorities will say that, look, sir, I'm taking, I'm uh, remand, uh, give me remand for two days, and the balance I will take later, right? And if the accused says that, look, grant me bail, he says, how can I grant you bail? The matter is still under investigation. So after one month, he will ask for another five days. So still there will be left a balance. Then after a month, he will ask for another five days. So in other words, now the law will be implemented in such a manner that a person arrested on suspicion will never get bail for 60 days, right, or 90 days as the case may be. In other words, you made the law far more oppressive than what it was earlier. Then, as I was mentioning to you, there is this provision, 173 of the code. Well, that's very interesting. It says, every information relating to the commission of a cognizable offense irrespective of the area where the offense is committed may be given orally or by electronic communication to an officer in charge of a police station and if given orally it shall be reduced in writing by him under his direction be read over to the informant and every such information whether given in writing or reduced in writing shall be signed by the person giving it by electronic communication, it shall be taken on record by him on being signed within three days from the person giving it, and the substance thereof shall be entered in a book to be kept by such officer in such form as the state government may by rules prescribe. Now this, this now, if you look at 183, says any magistrate of the district in which the information about commission of an offense has been registered may whether or not he has jurisdiction in the case, record the confession or statement made to him in the course of an investigation under this chapter or under any other law for the time being in force or any time afterwards before the commencement of inquiry or trial. So therefore now you can investigate an offense, right? Anywhere in India and the magistrate anywhere in India outside the area where the jurisdiction of the magistrate lies can record a confession. So all the investigation shall be done outside the jurisdiction of the police station where the offense is committed and that evidence and investigation then will be presented with a charge sheet to the magistrate where the trial will take place. So the investigation will be done somewhere else and the trial will happen somewhere else. This is both unconstitutional in terms of violation of the federal structure and even otherwise because it's not a reasonable procedure established by law. These are some of the major flaws as far as procedure is concerned. 
Now, if you look at the Nyaya Samhita, that is the penal code, that has some very interesting provisions. Let me just give you some examples. There is a provision called organized crime. That's 111 of the Nyaya Samhita. It says, any continuing unlawful activity including kidnapping, robbery, theft, extortion, land grabbing, contract killing, economic offense, cyber crimes, traffic of persons, drugs, weapons or illicit goods or services, human trafficking, prostitution or ransom by any person or a group of persons acting in concert singly or jointly, either as a member of an organized crime or on behalf of any syndicate by use of violence, threat of violence, coercion, intimidation, or any other unlawful means to obtain direct or indirect material benefit, including a financial benefit, shall constitute a organized crime. Now, what is organized crime? Means a group of two or more persons who act singly or jointly. So if two people get together and commit theft, it is organized crime. If two people get together and grab land, it is organized crime. If two people get together and, and threaten somebody with violence, it is organized crime. And, uh, and then the, 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 it, what is important here is the definition of continuing unlawful activity means an activity prohibited by law which is a cognizable offense punishable with imprisonment of three or more years. So any such activity which is punishable with more than three years done by two persons is organized crime. Then economic offense is also defined as offense includes criminal breach of trust, forgery, counterfeiting of banknotes, hawala transactions, fraud or running away a scheme to defraud several persons or doing in any act in any manner with a view to defraud any bank or financial institution or any other institution or organization for obtaining monetary benefits in any form. So this kind of economic activity, offense, is also organized crime. So, in fact, any form of human activity in which the action of two persons or more amounts to the commission of an offense punishable with three years or more becomes organized crime. Now, see the consequences of it. Whoever commits organized crime, if such an offense is resulted in the death of any person, we punished with death or imprisonment for life and shall also be liable to fine. In any other case, be punishment with imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than five years. So if two people snatch a chain, a minimum is five years. But which may extend to imprisonment for life. If two people commit an economic offense, five years or imprisonment for life. If two people threaten somebody, intimidate somebody, five years or life imprisonment. And whoever attempts, abets, conspires, or knowingly facilitates the commission of an organized crime, or otherwise engages in any act preparatory to an organized crime, shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than five years. So a preparatory uh, act also for the commission of an offense. If two people get together and say, Kal hum yaha chori karenge, so that's minimum five years. Now, and then whoever, who, who, any person who is a member of an organized crime syndicate, what is organized crime syndicate? It's two or more persons. So if there are, say, four persons, who are together, but two of them do not actually do anything. The other two do. 
then the law says any person who is a member of an organized crime syndicate shall be punishment with, a, uh, with imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than five years. So I have not done any act. An allegation in the complaint is that I am a member of the organized crime. I am not involved in that offense. Two others are involved in the offense. Allegation is that I am also part of that. I will also be punished for five years. Now that complaint can easily be made. Names can, no, in India what happens is people, the police itself add names. So the fellow will not get bail, he will be in custody, he will say I was not a member of that. They will say but no we believe you have reasonable suspicions that you are a member of that organized crime and you will be inside for five years you won't get bail. Whoever possesses any property derived or obtained from the commission of organized crime or proceeds of any organized crime or which has been acquired through organized crime shall be punished with imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than three years. So if somebody does any chain snacking and go, goes, goes, goes and sells it and gives it to another person who is found with it, he will also be inside. So these are some extremely liberal provisions, I must say, uh, that, uh, that, that the Home Minister and the, this government has thought of. Even more serious now is the definition of a terrorist act. This really takes the cake. Whoever does, it's 113 of the, of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sanita, called BNS. Whoever does an act with the intent to threaten or likely to threaten the unity, integrity, sovereignty, security, or economic security of India, or with the intent to strike terror or likely to strike terror in the people, or any section of the people of India, <coughs> by using bombs, this, that, and the other, or are likely to cause death or loss or damage or destruction to property. Now you see, just think of protests. Protests made, farmers' protests made, lead to destruction of public property or rail loco yatras or something like that, which lead to destruction of property, that's a terrorist act. <coughs> if it leads to loss, of or damage to or destruction of property or disruption of supplies of services essential to the life of the community, damage to the monetary stability of India by way of production or smuggling or circulation of counterfeit Indian paper currency or any other material or damage to destruction of any property in India, any property in India or in connection with any uh, intended to be used for the defense or in connection with any other purposes of the government of India or any state agencies or overalls by means of criminal force or show of criminal force or attempts to do so or causes death to any public functionary or attempts to cause death, detains, kidnaps, abducts or whatever, whatever, commits a terrorist act. So now protests, dharnas resulting in destruction, damage, loss will be terrorist attacks. And then, and whoever commits a terrorist act, if it results in death of a person, will be punished with death or life imprisonment, or in any other case, be punishment be uh, punished with imprisonment for a term which shall be not less than five years. And then, any person who is a member of an organization which is involved in a terrorist act, and you know what the terrorist act now is, shall be present, punished with imprisonment for a term which will extend to life. And whoever harbors voluntarily, conceals or attempts to harbor or conceal. So if the protesters are there and they go and sleep in the neighborhood in somebody's house, the neighbor will be deemed to have harbored those terrorists, right? And that neighbor will also get at least three years imprisonment. 
So if you provide food to those protesters who are protesting against the government, you will all be part of that and all be liable to punishment. And whoever knowingly possesses or any, uh, uh, possesses any property derived or obtained from commission of any terrorist act or acquired through the commission of, an in, uh, of, of any terrorist act shall be punishment for a term which can go up to life. So this is the kind of laws that we have. Now, these are some of the provisions. I don't want to sort of really go on and on on this. The question then arises, are these laws consistent with Article 21? They are per se unreasonable. And procedurally, they are unreasonable. The other provision which is of very disturbing is 109, I think, of the Nyaya Sanita. But then also there is something called petty organized crime. Which is also interesting. Whoever being a member of a group, either singly or jointly, commits any act of theft, snatching, cheating, 420. Unauthorized selling of tickets, unauthorized your, your cinema tickets or railway tickets, unauthorized betting or gambling, selling of public examination question papers. There are some of the government people will be caught in this or any other similar criminal act is said to commit a petty organized crime, where also they'll be punished for not less than one year. And uh, so we have a situation now where all these offenses become punishable. Now, instead of the sedition provision, you have another provision which says that if you if you, if you uh, impact the security of India, integrity of the country, you'll be in prison for life. So, sedition which has been stayed by the Supreme Court has come in another form, much worse. Now, that's about these laws. Now you take the PMLA. At least in the Code of Criminal Procedure in some of these laws, the police officer does acts under the overall supervision, supposedly, of the magistrate. The accused will have to be produced before the magistrate every 14 days. Um, demand will be taken to judicial custody and all that. That's the normal procedure. And at the time of investigation, there will be a daily diary. A daily diary will be paginated. And every day, whatever the police officer does will be entered in the daily diary. That will be scrutinized by the magistrate to make sure that the investigation is continuing in a proper fashion. All that is part of procedure, which is part of the Code of Criminal Procedure 1973, as well as the original Code of Criminal Procedure. Now, that, those provisions are completely absent in PMLA. There is no procedure. There is no daily diary under the PMLA. You can put any paper in the file at any time without pagination. And I've done several cases in which after I have made the arguments, they realize that there is a lacuna, they will put in a document. And say next time, they tell the court, see this document was there. Now, how do I know that it was there, it was not there? Because I know for a fact that when I made the argument, right, this was the argument I submitted, and they want to fill up the lacuna, and they provide that document. Now, therefore, as I mentioned to you, under Article 21, no person can be deprived of his life or liberty, save in accordance with procedure established by law. Now, a lack of procedure 
the Supreme Court says is procedure established by law. In Vijay Madanlal Chaudhary. Because there is no procedure on the basis of which you do an investigation. None whatsoever. Why? Because they say they are not police officers. They are not police officers because ultimately what is filed in court is a complaint and not a charge sheet. Police officers file a charge sheet and others file complaint. A public functionary files a complaint. But under the PMLA, the director, deputy director of enforcement directorate and all the four or five kinds of officers are entitled to arrest the person like any other police officer. They are entitled to seize documents like any other police officer. They are entitled to search like any other police officer. They are entitled to remand like any other police officer. So they have all the powers of a police officer. Right? So if they have all the powers of a police officer, then why is it that they don't have to go through the procedure which is established by law during the course of investigation. The ruling of the court, and we've been agitating about this for a few years now, is that this is a sui generis legislation. That's what Vijay Madanlal Chaudhary says. That it's a sui generis legislation. The intent of the legislation is actually not to punish. The intent of the legislation is to attach the property which has been money laundered. I don't know whether you are familiar with the PMLA or not, but let me just explain to you one or two concepts. If I commit a crime, say cheating, and cheating is a scheduled offense under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, then any money derived from cheating are proceeds of crime. Right? Now, if with that cheating, I put that money in a bank and show before the income tax officer that this is derived from my own income, so that that tainted money is legitimate money, then I have laundered that money, like in a, you put dirty clothes in a washing machine and they come out clean, so you put dirty money into the bank and it comes out clean, that's laundering money, right? So the offense, the predicate offense is proceeds of crime, that is cheating. The laundering, offense of money laundering, is converting tainted money into untainted money. Right? Now, what they have done in Vajay Madanlal Chaudhary, they have said that there is no difference between the two. Proceeds of crime are also uh, amounts to laundering, is money laundering. So you have a predicate offense and you have the offense of money laundering, but there are two separate offenses. Money laundering, money laundering is an offense under the PMLA. Predicate offense is an offense under any other act. Criminal, under the penal code becomes the predicate offense. Any other statute, if there's an offense made out, it becomes a predicate offense. If you launder that money, it's money laundering. So you can't, in fact, say that they are the same. Constitutionally, you can't say that. The original definition under Section 3 of the Money Laundering Act was that if, if proceeds of crime are converted into untainted property, then it would amount to money laundering. So they made the, they, they, they said and and what is tainted becomes untainted becomes money laundering. Then through a finance act they added an explanation which converted and into or. 
that finance act that explanation was added in the finance act so therefore it couldn't go to rajya sabha it was deemed to be a money bill which is not a money bill but they said the court said this or that is added has obliterated the and and the or is added through an explanation it's not part of the original section so how can an explanation obliterate the main section but that's what the court held so we've been clamoring that what kind of procedures are these and it is creating havoc in this country the way these people are arresting people the manner in which they are arresting the manner in which documents from my own knowledge are extremely suspicious which have been relied upon all this this shows is that now politics in this country or rather law in this country has become an instrument for politics and these three laws epitomize that trend all these laws will now be used for the purposes not for nyay but to ensure that you punish people whether you have the evidence or not the same thing is true of the uapa and quite frankly if you really look at every morning's newspaper 75% of the news is only about law and politics iski giraftari ho gayi uh is ka demand nahi mila uh cbi ne court ne raat di to cbi ne dusre offense mein usko andar kar diya so you, you can't have a democratic country where the functioning of the state is based on the misuse of laws for the purposes of threatening uh individuals entities and and hope that in that process which is why we are seeing the 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 fact that lakhs of several high net worth people are leaving this country the impact of that is that our economy is stagnant because nobody wants to invest anymore because nobody wants to be in a position to be targeted in this fashion laws and laws laws are getting more and more intrusive and the real issues before the people have nothing to do with this it's something to do with empowerment of the people of our country something to do with the empowerment of our kids something to do with the fact that we have 800 million people earning less than 10000 rupees a month in this country the fact is that 83% of the youth are unemployed in this country right instead of addressing ourselves to those issues we are now legislating on such laws to in fact threaten the lives of people to ensure that they function in conformity with the values not of the constitution but the values of those who rule us thank you very much thank you very much mr sibal as in that was a it was a great class on the new criminal laws i learned many things uh, of provisions that i didn't know of uh, i do want to play devil's advocate though uh, and especially since uh, the home minister announced that he is open to amending these laws and yes. several states have also started uh, their process of making official amendments to these three legislations i want to ask you that if there were there was one thing that you wanted to change in these laws which you think would be uh, uh, the most critical change what would that be that we reduce uh, abolish this arrest by a police officer and remand to custody for 15 days and replace it with go back to the old provision no 
The role provision should never have been there. That's the legacy of the British. So uh, what about a provision on arrest? What about what? You can arrest a person and produce him before the magistrate. Right. And let the magistrate hand over whatever prima facie evidence the police officer has to the accused. Right. Let the accused arrest the court. And then the court will either grant him bail or not grant him bail. And this time period, as in what, you, what would you say about the time period? The 24 hours. Within time 24 period. hours. Within 24 hours. See, you must understand. When you arrest a person, you take away his liberty. That's right. Right? It's not some, some small thing. That's right. You take away his liberty. You must have some real reasons to take away my liberty. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. What are those real reasons? Somebody files a complaint and you take away my liberty. That's right. That can't be a reason. That's right. Right? That complaint must be based on evidence. That, that complaint must be accompanied by evidence. So instead of reasonable suspicion, you would say tangible evidence or something of that nature would be the threshold, some higher threshold. No, evidence that can be demonstrated to a court of law. Right. Right? After notice to me. After notice, yeah. Right? That's right. Otherwise, what happens is he produces it before the magistrate. I don't know what he has produced. At that stage under the law, I'm not entitled to any document. I'm not entitled to any information. It's between the magistrate and him. That's and right. my lawyer is not able to say that I'm innocent because I don't know why I'm guilty. That's right. That's the problem. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable suggestion. And uh, if I may also ask you, since uh, at least on paper, as if you're now politically non-aligned, uh, some of these legislations that you talked about, the UAPA, for example, the NDPS Act, I mean, these are legislations that have been passed long before the NDA government was in power. It's of true. course, the NDA government has come in and has carried this on, which is why I believe that this is a question of the citizen vis-a-vis -vis the state. The state has always been oppressive towards citizens which is kind of the trademark of a colonial state. And as you said, we have reinforced some of that with these legislations, as have we with the BN, as have we with the NDBS, with the UAPA, and whoever's been in power has kind of reinforced that. So do you think that this is continuation of the same type? Do you see this as a citizen state issue, or do you see something markedly different in these three legislations? In these three legislations. That's right. No, I think the intent of the legislations is to, is to, is to control the people of this country, control the social media platforms, control citizens of this country, control the student community, control uh, you know kisans, all forms of protest. Right. Do you think the UAPA wasn't good enough for that? No, this is the other issue. This these laws. You can, a police officer can prosecute you under the, uh, under the um, uh, UAPA as well as under, under the Bharatiya uh, Nyaya Sanita. That's right. Right? So you have a special law which has a special procedure. For example, in some of these prosecutions, you have to get the sanction That's right. before prosecution. Right? Under this, you don't have to. Right? So therefore, how does a police officer decide that I will prosecute you in UAPA and not prosecute you under this, or I prosecute you under BNS and not prosecute you under UAPA. That kind of discretion should not be available. In other words, if you have a special law already on the same subject matter, it should not be part of BNS. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's another problem. Absolutely. And we keep duplicating these provisions all the time exactly. in various laws. And let me tell you another thing. When the UAPA, in the UAPA, I remember the Home Minister moving in the Rajya Sabha that we want to name the terrorist. Oh. Right? And if you'll see, I, 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 I oppose that. Uh, and I said that, look, this will allow you to misuse this legislation. He said to me, uh, how can you possibly object? Because if there are terrorists in Pakistan and I want to name him, why should you object to that? And my answer that my answer to that was the the terrorist in Pakistan, you can name him, we have no problems with that, except that you know that you'll not be able to do anything about that terrorist in Pakistan, yes, but you will be actually naming our own citizens as terrorists. That's exactly what they did. That's right. And I think the, the one point that became clear during your lecture is this point that we raised time and again, which is the amount of discretion that our statutes vest in police officers. Yes. There is vagueness right. in the statute, whether it's reasonable suspicion, what is reasonable. Tenetable and this is information. That's right. 
and 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 you could see this even in a in a traffic offense right there there will you never really know it depends really on the mood of the policeman this is even without getting into anything on corruption but it really depends on the mood of the policeman as to whether you're going to get a thousand rupee fine or someone's going to take right, some right, proceedings right, right. against you so what in your view is the is a potential pathway to a solution on this is it remove discretion is it try to canalize discretion is it try to have some checks and balances before the exercise of discretion how do we think about this problem? Well, 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 I talked about it. All this should be consistent with Article 21. The, any procedure in any statute must be reasonable. What is reasonable depends on the facts and circumstances of each case. But procedurally, you can't take my life and liberty, right, without a procedure. That's exactly what's happening under the PMLA. There is no procedure. And that's exactly what's happening under these laws. Because I can st be put in fi for 15 days, I'll never know what is against me. So, so test it on the basis of 21. And Menika Gandhi has said so, and it stood the test of time. And I hope that the Supreme Court does correct its gross error in Vijay Madanlal Chaudhary's case, which has given this carte blanche to the ED. Uh, there, uh, there's a large audience here. I don't want to monopolize Mr. Sibyl. Uh, so he has kindly agreed to take a few questions from the audience. So uh, there is a mic that will come to you. Please raise your hands, introduce yourself, and please keep your questions uh, short so that we can try and get a few in. Yeah. So if I could see any, any hands up, there's a hand up here. And a hand up here. Uh, but before, before they ask any questions, there is one other thing I want to mention to you. Now, in some of these laws, special legislations, not in, in the Aisa Neta, but some of these special laws, you have these bail condition, That's right. which says that you, you will not get bail till the public prosecutor is heard. And you will only get bail if the court comes to the conclusion that you are not guilty of the offense. Now, how is that constitutional? That's right. How does the court at the stage of bail, when I don't even know what is the case against me, ever come to the conclusion that I am not guilty of the offense, when I have no procedure through which I can demonstrate, because I have no document in my hand, that I am not guilty of the offense? That's right. And if the court comes to the conclusion that I am not guilty of the offense, why should I just get bail? Then I should be discharged. Absolutely. It makes no sense. And yet the Supreme Court upholds such a law. We'll now you can ask. We'll take a few questions together because I've seen lots of hands. Yeah. yeah. Hi, you. good evening, sir. I am, am I audio? Not really. Yeah, hi. Good evening, sir. I'm Shivang. Just speak up a little bit. You uh, I'm a fourth year student at National Law University, Mumbai. I, one of the criticisms of this law is that it essentially puts two criminal justice systems in place with the previous laws and the new laws that have been introduced. Uh, with your experience, what, what should India actually, uh, what, have, what has been the uh, fallacies that you have seen since the, uh, the laws have been implemented and what could be the lessons that we can learn potentially in future so that the conflict is avoided? We'll take a few together because there's just many. Ah, okay, okay. There's one here. Could you get the, get the mic here, please? Just pass it on then. You just take two questions from uh, good evening, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, the question is, in India, we have this concept of justifying police custody with reference to, as opposed to judicial custody, with reference to the supposed need for custodial interrogation. Um, I've always been puzzled by that concept. I mean, surely, uh, uh, given that the police officer is not supposed to touch you and should only be asking you questions and should not be hitting you at all, uh, any interrogation that's required can be done in the mulakat room of, of the jail as well. So, so, is it sort of some sort of implicit understanding of that we all share that actually the police lockup is where the real questioning will happen and once you're in judicial custody, you are out of the hands. I mean, I've always wondered whether in a truly developed system, you should be sent straight away to judicial custody in all cases, even if no bail should be granted. And the police officer is free to come and question you for as long as he likes inside the heart. But I mean, that's the, precisely the point I made, yes. that there should be no police custody. Because what's the difference between police and judicial custody? The constitution, or rather the judicial assumption is that it's good to have him in police custody, that you can be beaten up a few times. <laughs> Otherwise, what's the difference? You are in custody, no? 
So if you are in police custody and if your police officer is civilized, then there is no difference between police custody and judicial custody. So why should you have police custody unless you assume that in police custody you will be threatened, you will be intimidated, you will be told I will arrest your wife, I will arrest your daughter, I will prosecute your family, I will do this, I will do that. Unless you do this, unless you make this statement, unless you name this chief minister or name that, that government servant or name this person or that person. That's what police custody is all about, which is why I'm against it, which is why I said that I don't accept this. The whole concept is unreasonable. But as far as the conflict is concerned, actually the fact is that 95% of these laws are the old laws. It's only those 5% which I've read to you are the provisions that are meant to aggrandize the state with greater power. Uh, for their, uh, you know, rather narrow uh, ends. There are some question at there are some questions at the back. We'll just yeah here in the black shirt, and then we'll come back to the two. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Vansha, a student at Naida Bhuvaneshwar. So, sir, my question is not based in law, but a general practice. So, like, I'm a student, and I don't have much legal. Who am I? <laughs> yes, sir. We're all students. Yes, sir. So, like. Uh, you talked a lot about the legal provisions and how the state is getting more tyrannical. Sir, so I am asking as a, as a student, as a citizen, what can I do to protest without being labelled a terrorist? <laughs> how can we help? Just take a chance. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll defend you. <laughs> uh, greetings sir, I am a fourth year law student, my name is Tosip. Now, sir, as we see, BNS is uh, defining economic offence, which has also been covered by PMLA. But the good part, what I find here in, sir, that when the person is booked under BNS, he gets out of the stringent bail condition of section 45 of PMLA. But here the problem is, it will be onto the whims and fancy of the investigating officer. So what could be the threshold for determining that the person for an economic offence will be booked for, for, say, PMLA or BNS? But it can't be, no? There should be, if there's a special offense in, under a special statute, it should not be in the general statute. But and if it's in the general statute, it should not be part of the statute. So you have to decide which law do you want, to, which law should prevail. But that's the, that's the task of the legislation, no? The legislation should not be like this, that the police officer has the discretion to prosecute you under either of these provisions. That's unfair, that's, un, that's unfair discretion, no? Arbitrary. That's right. There's one more there at the back. Uh. Good evening, sir. I am Injila Muslimadi. I am practicing advocate. Uh, sir, actually, in many bail cases, uh, there is one condition for getting a bail, and that is to cooperate with the investigating agencies. So, what does this cooperation actually mean? Like, what is the ambit of this cooperation? See, what happens is if you don't give police the answers they want, then you are not cooperating. But what if they ask me to uh, accept the crime which I have not committed? Well, that's not, that's not permissible. You know, police officers, that confession is not admissible in law. So that's not an issue. Right. We have many more questions. We'll take one here. Hello, sir. So, uh, so one part of this uh, discussion is that law is being used as a political instrument. Well, the other part is that, speaking from the l language of masses, what I would say if I had a chain snatched is that there should have been harsher punishment so he doesn't get away with it when there is an actual crime that is committed. But at the same time, there is also a, there are, there is so much literature saying that capital punishment or harsher punishment doesn't really help in reducing the crime rate. So how does it really work? Uh, or what is the practical solution of it in the context of the BNS because that is how they're selling it that harsher punishments will reduce uh, you know reduce the crime rate that's the USP of this at least in the masses. I think I think since uh, in the inception of civilization we have been uh, enacting laws dealing with corruption right in, in order to eradicate corruption right so what is the title of this act Prevention of Money Laundering Act. What's the assumption? There's going to be money laundering. Right? Prevention of Unlawful Activities Act. What is the assumption? There will be unlawful activities. Right? In, in society, there will be crimes. Right? In society, there will be unlawful activities. There will be corruption. You cannot eradicate it. 
You, it's just not possible. The history of the world has shown that you have never been able to eradicate. Right? Now, all that you need to do in law, and that's Article 21, you can have a punishment, punish him in accordance with law, in accordance with the gravity of the crime. So that's why the test of proportionality. Right? The, the, the nature of the crime will determine the punishment. Right? If you kill somebody, you can, depending on circumstances in the rarest of rare cases, be awarded the death penalty. Right? So that is left to the discretion of the judge. So harsher punishment for crimes that, for which there should not be a harsh punishment would be struck down on the basis of lack of proportionality. And that's the test and that's a reasonable way of dealing with crimes. There was a question there at the back. Hello, sir. My name is Ali Asghar. No I'm from Jamia Mil Islamia. Uh, sir, my question is very simple. Like you, uh, you have, you have given us a comparative analysis of PMLA and BNS and BNSS. Like, uh, don't you think, uh, like, in the power of deputy di director and director under PMLA under Section 49 or Section 2, like same as the investigation officer in BNS on BNSS. And my second question is, like, in uh, PMLA under Section 4, the minimum punishment for money laundering, like, uh, the big crime, is three years. Like, minimum three years uh, is seven years up to extend seven. to seven years. Under cases, Schedule 2, ten. seven to ten. But bare minimum, it's three years. But under BNSS, like, the theft, uh, the theft punishment, uh, like you said, is five years. Five years, and the and the previous are uh, that's in, that's if it's organized crime. If it's organized crime, like PMLA would also organize crime, like in some extent. Not necessarily. Uh, and uh, like in IPC, there would also three. So what's years. What's the question, son? What's the question? Like, what is the difference between them? Like PMLA also gives us three-year punishment, and the uh, IPC that's also. That's separate offences, beta. PMLA is a separate offence altogether. It's money laundering, nothing to do with ordinary crimes. So there will be separate punishment for that. Nothing wrong with that. The only thing is that if you have a special law and you have the same, for the same offense you have a general law, the, the legislation must decide which one you want to actually implement. That's, that's the real problem. There's a question here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Also, I wanted to thank you for starting your YouTube. Really, really oh, okay. that. Uh, my question is that Lord Macaulay has been a very contested figure because of his infamous minute. But the more I read about his role in drafting the criminal code that existed, it's actually done a lot of good. So how do you perceive his legacy? In fact, if you really look at Lord Macaulay's penal code, it has been copied by every European country, word for word. It was such a fine piece of legislation. And actually, they say it's, this government says it's the legacy of the British Raj. Actually, it is not. Because thereafter, we've had several amendments. After law commissions have sat, they have amended the penal code. They, in fact, we have the, the new code of criminal procedure, the 1973 code. Right? So it's not a legacy of the British. It's our own legacy. So what are they trying to say that we wanted to get rid of the legacy of the British? They wanted to get rid of their own legacy, which is why they have changed all these laws. So Macaulay's law, like actually, the, look at the Evidence Act, for example. Such a fine piece of legislation. Now they say that their witnesses can be examined in the police station. Police station. And uh, the cross-examination should be done through video conferencing. Which, car, which country in the world allows for that? You see your, um, your jury trial, can you do it through video conferencing? Can you do trials through video conferencing? You can be sitting at the police station and the guy will be treating you, he'll have something in his hand and he'll be reading out. How will the magistrate know what's happening? It's absurd. I mean, I don't know how these fellows made these laws. And it's not about politics, Beta. You ask that question. It's not about politics. It's about giving the police... See, there is a nexus between the police officer and the politician and the businessman. Right? Not bu businessmen even at the local level. So, 
it's the it's the element of discretion and the fact that the police comes under the larger administrative control of the government that he acts at the instance of the powers that be that power may be that of a politician of a political class or it could be of any other person as well it may be a local gunda who exercises that power he may not be a politician at all the problem is with discretion which is why when 21 says procedure established by law it eliminates discretion therefore law has to be reasonable that's the litmus test of any piece of legislation which has not been followed by the Supreme Court in many cases. Right. We have time for two final, maybe we take one quick round. Yeah. Good evening, sir. I'm very, it is a very wonderful experience to meet you in person. Sir, my name is Gaurav Kumar and I'm a third year law student of Delhi University. So, sir, I'm asking this question to you considering as a parliamentarian. Sir, nowadays we see that parliament is not having an intense discussion on any legislation, sir. In BNS, when there is no any intense discussion, only minister says about this thing. And sir, in several cases, sir, so parliament is just used to vote and pass the bill. And it's not for the deliberation and discussion on any bill, sir. Even many legislators gritties of the BNS and many laws, sir. So, do you think that parliament is not working its function properly, sir? No, it's like it's not so. I think that's too, 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 too strong a statement. See, most legislations, uh, and that's been the practice of parliament, are sent to either standing committees or select committees. And those standing committees and select committee proceedings are in camera. They're not open to public view. And I have personal experience that when we are members of those committees, we don't act in a partisan manner, right? So we discuss uh, the pieces of legislation and with the limited experience that we have as legislators, we then get the pass, the, you know, send the report to, to parliament then based on that report, the government takes a position. First, it's sent to the government. Government analyzes the recommendations of the standing committee or the select committee. Then gets the feedback from the bureaucrats as to what should be done. Accepts some recommendations, does not accept any recommendations, some recommendations. Then introduces the bill in parliament. Then the debate takes place, right? Now, at that point in time, remember, and this is a conundrum that every legislation faces. You legislate because you want to deal with a particular problem in society. Money laundering is a problem, so you want, and there is a global convention, there is a commitment of the government of India that we should have a legislation on money laundering. So, but people are not experienced. Leg members of parliament are not experienced on what happens on the ground as far as money laundering is concerned. So you pass a piece of legislation. Then legislation is tested on the basis of actual cases that come to court. Right? Now the Lord need not, may not have envisaged that kind of case at all. So you will always find a conflict between the legislation and the reality on the ground. And the law is always behind the reality, never in front of it. Because law by itself cannot envisage the millions of human situations which are then dealt with by the law. And therefore, justice comes into the picture. Courts decide in the context of those human situations whether this law is reasonable or not reasonable, how it is to be interpreted, and how that human situation will fit into that legislation. That's the dynamics of law, legislation, and the functioning of society. That dynamics results in judicial pronouncements. Judicial pronouncements result in precedents. And at a certain point in time, the society changes its interactions in such a way that the law becomes redundant. That's the time when you seek amendments in the law 
to deal with new human situations. So that's the kind of dynamics that keeps on happening and that's how law develops. But law is always behind society. But you, you've, Mr. Sibyl, been in all three organs. You've been in the legislature, the executive, and you deal with the judiciary on an everyday basis. Which organ do you think, if I were to put you on, a, in, on the spot, has the maximum potential to deliver for citizens on an everyday basis? Obviously, the court. The court? Yes. That's an interesting one. Obviously, obviously. The, hmm. Parliament can never deliver. Hmm. See, Parliament is not concerned with the constitutionality of legislation. You must if I may say, neither are the people most of the time. What? Concerned with the constitution. That's not the point. The that's not the point. Parliament is not concerned with, that's not its job. Hmm. The job that's of right. parliament is to pass legislation. The job of the court is to test legislation. Right. And the job of the people is to protest <laughs> if there is injustice. If protest becomes organized crime, you have a problem. <laughs> We'll take three quick last questions. I'm sorry, we are really out of time. You had your hand up for a while, one, two, and three. I'm really sorry, we are really out of time, but please, please make it short. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I am Divyanshi. Uh, I'm a law student, and your lecture was really wonderful. Uh, I just have a small question that uh, we have had so many presidents in the past who have really uh, made our fundamental rights more concrete, such as you mentioned Menka Gandhi case. So how will that precedence interact with the new law? How does precedent interact with the yes. new law? The well, have we wiped out our criminal jurisprudence of so many years? Maybe not Maneka Gandhi because that's an Article 21 case, but say the IPC, the settled jurisprudence that we had, will it continue or will it, is it all wiped out? No, but out? this is the other problem with these laws. These laws do not incorporate the judicial pronouncements of the court. In other words, these laws should be consistent with the judicial pronouncements of the Supreme Court. They are inconsistent on many occasions. I can't hear. Yeah, I think I mean ones like Manika Gandhi will still continue because they are an interpretation of Article 21. So these, as Mr. Sibyl said, will be tested. These laws will be tested against Article 21 as interpreted also by the 14. Court. Also 14. Of course. 14, and 21, 19. They all will be tested on these three. Yeah. Uh, but life and liberty, of course, is a is a very special right. Yeah. Good evening, sir. I am Ahmed Ali from uh, Jami Hamdad University. Sir, first of all, thank you for the uh, wonderful lecture. So my question is, uh, like, these three new criminal laws, they heavily rely on the technology, right? And in the era of AI, we, we don't have a perfect, a good legislation onto AI. And we have seen many examples, like they were deep fake recently. So uh, what are your views? Is India ready to heavily rely on uh, onto technology where AI, on the other hand, it, it doesn't have a uh, law onto it. So what are your but views on AI? To? By and large, has really nothing to do with legislation as such. I mean, AI is not going to uh, intervene in the processes of the law when trials are going to take place. It's technology. It technology is it's technology, still evolving, not yeah. by itself AI. Technology is not necessarily AI. But for example, if you have uh, cross-examination, the video conferencing, that is not AI. Yeah. But I'm saying these are these will, these will have to be tested because the whole purpose of of cross-examination is to figure out how the witness is responding, what is what is uh, physical responses are, what his expressions are. The judge then gets a feel whether he's telling a lie or he's telling the truth. So therefore, you have to, the judge, the magistrate must have the witness before him to ultimately come to the conclusion during the course of the trial and, the, and, and incorporate it in his judgment whether he's a witness who can be relied upon or not. So the physical aspects of his presence are extremely important for the credibility of that witness. Mm -hmm. Now that can't be done through video conferencing and use of technology. Technology should be used, must be used, for example. If you have to produce a person before a magistrate and now this happens, you don't have to come and physically present it before the magistrate. You can do through video conferencing, but nothing much is to be done. So several of those things can be done through technology. For example, when I was HRD minister, a minister of science and technology, something very interesting. Something I, you know, probably you haven't heard. So I told my, you know, um, 
secretaries of science and technology. I said, there's a lot of uh, an illegal construction that is taking place in India. We're talking about technology. Yeah. And let's take Delhi. Can you give me a technology by which when I get up in the morning and I put my screen on, I can find out in which house in Delhi is there an illegal construction going on. Okay? So we worked for about six, eight months and we developed that technology. And we, that technology is available uh, in, 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 in my old constituency of Chandni Chowk with the MCD. And we tested it. I could figure out on the screen in whichever area I went as to where the illegal construction was taking place. Right. But the MC didn't want to use it. it was how will they earn money if they used it? So it's still redundant. I developed a, a, a device a mobile device by which if a police officer goes to the spot and takes a statement, it will be embedded his in, phone, in his phone, which means he can't change it. I developed those technologies. The police didn't want to use it. So you can use technology and you should use technology in order to get rid of discretion. Right? But nobody wants to get rid of discretion because discretion is the heart and soul of power and nobody wants to give up power, right? So the only hope is enlightened judges who believe in the rule of law. Last question, here. Good evening, sir. My name is Yakshana Sharma. I'm from uh, I'm final st in year student of CLC. My question is regarding what is the way forward, especially in the case where, as you said, that uh, the commitment of crime and the prosecution of crime is taking in two different places. Just let's suppose two different states ruled by two different political parties. And since we know the intention behind uh, why this legislation is brought forward, I wanted to understand the way forward and also. Uh, as a previous UPS, UPSC aspirant, uh, I, as of now, I have recognized the problem. You have said that the current, the new, uh, new criminal law isn't consistent with constitutional values. So I want to understand, after recognizing the problem as a student, what I want to understand what is the way forward. Thank way you. forward is challenge the law. What else is? What else can we do? And we also, can't, we like, can't. We can't persuade the enlightened people sitting in the government of India to change their 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 viewpoint on the subject. That's not going to be possible. Yeah. Uh, but the only hope is court. And as Mr. Aghya also mentioned, that some states are officially uh, changing the laws. Officially, no, they can't. They can't, right? No, no, of presidential not. assent. Okay. Are, if you want to change the law, you have to get presidential assent. So, if this is the mindset on the basis of which the law is made, you think any president will give assent? No, no definitely not. So, therefore, this is a non-starter. Okay. Yeah, but point is, it's not. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, the, there is this political aspect, but it's not all political. It's not all political. It's not only political. You know, it's ultimately the power structure will use these laws for their benefit. That power structure is not only political power, it's all kinds of power. There's economic power, there is all kinds of power. So, point is, the more, the less discretion you have in the law, the more there will be rule of law. Right? So, you have to, it, you have to eliminate discretion. That should be the objective of any society which embraces the rule of law, to eliminate discretion. What these laws do is actually they perpetuate discretion. That's the heart of the problem. I think that's a, that's a good note to end on, to say that our work has only just begun. Because if you look at the Penal Code and the drafting of the Evidence Act, there was a lot of politics that accompanied it. It was in the making for over two decades. But what we have with us today is the text of the legal provision that survived 150 years. And this too, of course, there's a lot of politics surrounding it. But as Mr. Sibyl rightly said, it's not all politics. And what we'll be left with very soon is a body of law. And this is only the starting point. There will be challenges. There will be amendments. There may even be part 
partly reenactments, but we'll have to see what shape that takes. And I think today we've had a real masterclass on the new criminal laws from Mr. Sibyl. So please join me in once again thanking Mr. Kapil Sibyl. We have a very small token of appreciation. I'll ask uh, Navid to give this token of appreciation. Thank you very much, Mr. Sibyl. And thank you very much to everyone in the audience for coming in, particularly all the young students who were here. It was lovely to see you. And I hope you have a good evening and good night. Sorry, I was a bit late. I got caught in a Sorry. meeting. My senior advocate standards, this was very early. <laughs> I love it.